much. I'm very happy to be here. I really appreciate you inviting me to speak today. I'm going to address the Alberta narrative on climate. And um, freedom of speech is one of the main reasons why I personally am involved in the climate change debate, because I'm not a scientist. But um, if we look at uh, what's happening, we find that climate change is a pervasive topic in society, especially in education. And more recently, let's look and see what the provincial and federal governments have been doing. They've engaged a fellow named Climate George to help shape the Alberta and Canadian narratives. And I call him a fox in the hen house. So an overview of what I'll be talking about today, once upon a time, um, climate science in Alberta schools, climate policy of past Alberta governments, Alberta's climate change and why, and the Alberta narrative, a mass propaganda project, and freedom of speech and the press. So that's a bit of an overview. So once upon a time, science was about evidence over ideology. Once, eminent scientists led the way, and now we are led by international child climate uh, activists. Once, earth scientists astonished us with facts, like that this 16,500 ton Okotoks big rock was pushed all the way to Okotoks from Jasper by a glacier, and, um, and that we were once under two miles of ice. And now climate scientists tell us to ignore facts and go with our feelings on climate change. Um, scary feelings. This is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe at Tell Us Spark. She's telling the audience um, that the 2013 flood uh, was due to climate change. In fact, the eight worst floods in Calgary's history were before 1933, which was long before human influence on climate was ever identified and two of those floods were more significant in flows than the 2013 flood. So, and you can see also in the corner, there's kind of a tilt-a-whirl version of warming. This is not a scientific graph of any kind. So, welcome to the new Lysenkoism, climate change dogma. Now, Lysenko was a supposed agricultural expert in the Soviet Union, Forbes has a very good short article on it, so I'm just going to read a bit of an excerpt. <clears throat> Under Lysenko's view, for example, grafting branches of one plant species onto another could create plant hybrids that would be perpetuated by the descendants of the grafted plant, or modifications made to seeds would be inherited by subsequent generations stemming from that seed, or plucking all the leaves off a plant would cause the descendants to be leafless. <laughs> but Lysenkoism was politically correct as a term invented by Lenin because it was consistent with certain broader Marxist doctrines. Marxists want to believe that hereditary issues had a limited role among humans and that human characteristics changed by living under socialism would be inherited by subsequent generations of humans and thus would be created the selfless new Soviet man. So this began in, in August 7th of 1948. The Academy of Agricultural Sciences decreed that thenceforth only Lysenkoism could be taught. All Soviet scientists were required to denounce any work that contradicted it. And those who resisted were imprisoned or even executed. And it, it was only abandoned in 1964. So that's a pretty long run, but it's actually shorter than climate change dogma, which is about 40, 40 years. So we have a little video on our, <coughs> excuse me, on our website, on our YouTube channel, uh, with Benoit Ritol, who is a mathematician from France, from the Association of the Climate Realists, and he talks about Lake Sinkluism. So where once facts and evidence, like those at the Terrell Museum made Alberta famous worldwide. Now, foreign funded activists, climate activists, teach the teachers at the ATA. Once science became politics, ideology began to rule over evidence. 
So if we look at climate science in Alberta schools, let's look at a bit of a case study. I didn't do a detailed review. This is just something that actually happened to me. <laughs> so, so climate science in Alberta schools. In 2012, I was a freelancer, and I just agreed to start working with Friends of Science as a part-time consultant. So we thought we'd look for some educational opportunities in the school system, and so I was looking online, and I was delighted to find that our name appeared already in the Alberta Science Educators Journal. Like, that was amazing. I found our name in online search, only to find that we were referred to in a pejorative way as contrarians. And worse, the author was advocating that the classroom education should increase the public certainty of climate <coughs> science. And worse still, the author argued that the media should not engage in fair and balanced debate. So Friends of Science have no record that this author ever contacted us to confirm his incorrect assumptions and assertions about our position on climate change and the qualifications of our then scientific advisors who he dismissed as being credible sounding. Now, this is a person who at that time did not have any significant degree and all of our scientific advisors are very experienced people and all had PhDs with many publications. So the author also advocated for suppression of opposing views. And he said in the article, as well as creating drama, this practice of emphasizing polarizing views is seen by journalists as a way to be objective and balanced in their reporting. However, it is irresponsible of mass media to give equal weight to conflicting points of view when the evidence so clearly supports one point of view and the result of this practice is a confused public. So that's what a teacher is teaching other teachers in a science educator's journal. Um, he also offered in that, in that story that he likes to use the day after tomorrow, which is a scary sci-fi film, as a teaching tool in class. So our Dr. Hutton wrote a rebuttal for the Alberta Science Educator's Journal. We have yet to see it published online. So what are the other narratives that we find in Alberta school material? This is some supplementary material. We find fear and we find worry. Look at these headlines. Peak of populations and early warning of climate change. Rising sea level will threaten millions of people around the world. Mountain pine beetles attack BC forests. And your cousin doesn't believe that we should be worried about climate change. So write him or her something about what you think. Are they really writing about what they think? They're already told you have to be worried about it. And obviously, we should be worried. Look what Greta Thunberg <coughs> tells us. She tells us, I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear that I feel every day. So this is a 16-year-old girl who addressed the World Economic Forum and those wealthy people had their private jets sitting outside on the tarmac waiting to pick them up and take them home and they all applauded her. So, so this we, we got recently also from a member. This is the Grade 7 Sun's homework, which is, is this the new normal about wildfires? So wildfire porn is very popular because you, can, you know, it's scary, it's terrifying and horrible things have happened but wildfires are a fact of life, and if anything, we should be teaching children about mitigation methods and how to use fire-safe tips and fire-wise in the States, um, and we're not doing that, we're just scaring them. And of course, they refer the students to extra work with David Suzuki Foundation, tips on how you can fight global warming. Gee, he's only in grade seven, <laughs> come on. So, should we be teaching science and math? or climate causes everything in school. This document comes from a, a recent survey of, 120, of 221 teachers done by the Alberta Climate Dialogue. All the teachers are very keen to have more material on climate change. And 
they think that it should be this climate tree of knowledge. So should we be teaching that climate change is everything, or should we be teaching math and science? And here's an even scarier thought. Are children being taught climate ideology to underwrite their teachers' pension plan investments? We also uh, spent quite a bit of time and effort wondering why the Alberta School Board's cons Commodities Purchasing Consortium was so keen to build a purpose-built Bull Creek wind farm. They worked very hard to get that. They even tried to get the Alberta Capital Finance Authority to finance it for them. <laughs> they didn't succeed in that, but they did build the farm. And guess who owns the company behind the farm now? It's the Ontario Teachers' Pension Plan. So the educational community is deeply invested, as Bill Tufts was talking about uh, retirements and pension plans and the unfunded liabilities. They're deeply invested in wind farms and teaching kids that this is a great thing to have, even though they're very ineffective. So let's step back and look at what the political and scientific climate was like in Alberta after Kyoto was ratified, which was, I believe, 1997. So in 2000, the Alberta government engaged Dr. Madhav Kandekar to do a literature review and tell them about the certainty or risks of the greenhouse gas theory of climate change. So they did due diligence. He found this theory to be quite uncertain. Dr. Kandekar was formerly a professor at the U of A. He's an Environment Canada researcher for 40 years, author of more than 150 papers. He's a past IPCC expert reviewer and former World Meteorological Organization regional expert and a UN consultant. So he's been around a bit. He knows a bit about what he's talking about. So the Alberta Climate Plan, the first climate plan, was not the one that the Premier keeps talking about, but actually was developed in 2002 and passed into law in 2003. This report, Moving Forward, was published in 2008, review reviewing the accomplishments so there are many, many firsts in Canada and in North America in terms of addressing environmental concerns and climate change concerns. So we had um, greenhouse gas reduction, environmental protection, carbon tax, but only on large emitters. And that money went into a research fund. Um, very significant spending on practical things, including a very comprehensive energy efficiency program. You'll hear all of these ENGOs and the Premier and the environment minister tell you over and over again, we never had an environment efficiency program until they came into power. That is completely false, because the previous governments replaced most of the um, taxis with hybrids. They replaced uh, washers and dryers. They had a municipal infrastructure loan program that gave a very excellent rate for innovation. They replaced all of the exit lights in Alberta, you can see the exit lights here, with LEDs. So, you know, these incremental but vast changes had a significant effect here. And they were constructive, they were practical, didn't waste people's money. So, but the Alberta climate changed in 2015. And not only because of a new government, but because of new pressures. And again, I hope people will think back to Bill Tufts' talk and his book, Pension Ponzi. So, NEI Investments is a signatory to the Montreal Pledge of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. And they showed up with a letter signed by 120 institutional investors and foundations and sovereign wealth funds, and it was all about climate and carbon. And this letter was for the Premier, Rachel Notley. And the United Nations Pr Principles for Responsible Investment is a group that was formed in 2005 it's made up of about 1,700 big institutional investors and pension funds. Um, these are uh, transnational and they are climate obsessed and all combined they sit on somewhere between 70 to 100 trillion dollars in assets under management. Um, so the Montreal Pledge that the UNPRI had put together uh, encouraged institutional investors to get out there and push corporations and governments not to be climate laggards, especially those in the US, Australia, and Canada. And so, in my view, most of the Alberta Climate Plan comes from proposals put through by, the, by NEI Investments. 
and surprisingly to me, on December the 14th, 2016, the Alberta government, a sub-sovereign uh, government, reported on the Alberta Climate Plan progress to the transnational, unelected, unaccountable UNPRI, an organization that has Al Gore as its guru on environment, social, and governance issues. So you can see where this is going. Now, Albertans were and are strongly resistant to the idea of carbon taxes, and these are some images from the Alberta-wide rally of November 5th, 2016, and what a quandary it must have been for the Alberta government, showing off their climate plan to the world while the peasants back home are in revolt. <laughs> so, the Alberta government, through Alberta Eco Trust, has engaged Climate George Marshall. He is a lifelong anti-oil activist, but now he's driving the Alberta Narratives Project. And that's what I open this presentation with. Climate George and Dr. Catherine Hayhoe were at Telespark at their second public event. They appeared there during the IPCC Cities Conference in Edmonton. And uh, Calgary also had climate events, so they came here as well. Climate George and Dr. Hayhoe are said to have special appeal to conservatives and Christians. So essentially, they were sent here as climate change missionaries. <laughs> so, now get this. Dr. Hayhoe had threatened Albertans with one degree Celsius warming in winter. <laughs> Did people check the weather today? You know, it's like minus 50 wind chill outside. <laughs> Anybody up for a one degree warming? <laughs> anyway. Um, and in her presentation, note that her winter map of, of, uh, is covered in red. You think it was hot as Hades here for us. I have the line F Ford F-350 driving Albertans, eh? So we now have climate lysenkoism in Alberta, and even major universities are part of this mass propaganda effort. To me, that's really, really sad. They have 19 partners, 75 organizations, 55 workshops, and they've trained 86 people as facilitators. So they're going to be kind of like Al Gore's climate reality, where you have trainees go out and facilitate more climate catastrophe, crisis meetings across the province and scare other people. Um, so it's a cross between a focus group and mass indoctrination. At the event that I attended in Calgary, Dr. Hayhoe asked us to talk with people beside us about our feelings about the Calgary flood. So, isn't climate change a scary thing? So the two women sitting beside me expressed fear, of course, because that's what they were told. Humans are highly suggestible. And uh, so then I told them that I was not afraid. I, I was sorry for the damage and the, the angst and the sorrow that had happened to many people. but. I was not afraid because it wasn't climate change. I told them the eight of the worst floods in Calgary's history happened before 1933, and this was a fact they didn't know. They were astonished to find that out. So then they weren't afraid anymore, because <laughs> facts matter. <laughs> but feelings are driving this conversation. So the crocodile tear mantra of climate George is that, of course, Albertans feel bad about what's going to happen to their careers in the future because they're facing a dying industry and job loss. Well, people are facing a dying industry. I mean, a job loss because we have pipeline blockade here. But when you look at the facts, there's no dying industry going on in the world. Oil demand is up. Coal demand is up. Natural gas demand is up. And this tiny, teeny, tiny little band of orange that's renewables. <laughs> this one, right here, that's renewables. And people keep telling you it's a booming industry and we're going to be able to rely on it anytime soon. That's not true. So, um, the evidence shows that we're only being hampered by this green trade war and people like Climate George and his anti oil colleagues and by these opportunistic green crony capitalists who keep sneaking through their fence of reason. Climate George, Dr. Hayhoe, this indoctrination program is being paid for with your taxes. 
Now, you'd think there'd be a public outcry, but as it happens, unfortunately, we have climate lysenkoism in the mainstream media as well. It would be funny if it wasn't so sad, and if, if not, so representative of exactly what the Alberta Science Educators Journal author was pressing for, that there would be no debate on climate. So here we see um, a uh, tweet from the Calgary uh, Star Metro reporter uh, stating that, you know, we have a non-conforming person here and therefore they should be condemned as a heretic. And then she's confirming that at their paper there will not be any debate, no debate, because they stand with the 97% of the world's scientists who agree. So first of all, there's never been a survey of all the world's scientists on climate change. And there's uh, the four best known surveys, only a minuscule percent of the scientists actually agree with the catastrophic view. It's a very small amount. The only thing that m the majority of scientists could generally be said to agree upon is that there has been warming from about 1860, and and that makes perfect sense because while well, we were leaving the Little Ice Age, right? in 1709 in France, it was so cold that people died on the streets of Paris. It was so cold in the Little Ice Age that birds dropped dead from the sky. And you can watch the documentary by, on, based on Brian Fagan's book called um, The Little Ice Age, How Climate Changed History. A and it's horrifying to read how uh, terrible the consequences were in that cold time. So we should be happy that we've warmed up a bit. And when you look further back in history, you see this is simply a cyclical part of how the world itself operates. So meantime, since uh, 1998, well, temperatures have pretty much flatlined. There's been no statistically significant warming for about 20 years. There have been some El Ninos that do cause a spike, but these are natural phenomena and we don't control them and we didn't cause them. So if we look now at the uh, Star Metro, the, the Metro Mothership, Toronto Star, and their journalistic standards and policies, they claim that there can be no compromise on accuracy. <laughs> So, and, and just to give you a bite here in the corner, you can see the famous Al Gore movie screen clip where he's claiming that there's almost 100% scientific consensus on global warming, and a closer look at that survey shows that only 13 scientists actually supported the catastrophic view. Most of them only mentioned the term global warming or climate change in their paper, but they held no position on it whatsoever. So, open public debate is crucial. The world is spending trillions of dollars every year on the wrong problem and the wrong solutions. And as I just mentioned, temperatures are dropping dr dramatically. Professor Francois, um, Francois Gervais has a presentation on our YouTube channel, and uh, we also have French and English translations on our blog, a transcript, because his accent may be difficult for some people to get. Anyway, and he shows that the climate sensitivity or the effect of carbon dioxide on warming. <coughs> By most scientists now, they agree that it's very, very small, nominal. And of course, yes, I see Norm Kalmanovich saying it's zero. Well, <laughs> but, uh, you know, let's assume that it's negligible. And if so, that means that if there's even lots more carbon dioxide in the air from human emissions, the effect will be nominal. It won't be warming. So. Um, most of the scientists that we know look at the solar activity, which is declining, declining rapidly and dramatically, and that historically means a time of cooling, of <coughs> unstable, erratic weather, and we should be preparing for that. That's what we should be spending the money on. So instead, we're spending billions on wind and solar and renewables, and here's a, a graph from the Alberta Electric System Operator of earlier this week. And uh, you can see we had one megawatt of wind power. One megawatt. And the temperature that day was in the minus 30s. So um, wind and solar do not address climate change, as Google found out. 
They can't power even basic society, not to mention they're unreliable and unsuited to Canada. And people say, oh, well, it's okay because we'll add storage. Well, a recent expert commentary on LinkedIn noted that to have enough storage for one day of power in Alberta would cost $69 billion. And, in fact, it's an impossibility at this time. There's not enough materials or production capacity to provide that amount of storage. So, Judith Curry, Dr. Judith Curry, has just written a new blog post explaining that phasing out fossil fuels will not change the weather. And she's saying that thinking on this kind of level is equivalent to doing a rain dance. And she's saying, imagine how surprised people would be if we ever were successful at eliminating all fossil fuel emissions and we still had bad weather. <laughs> so, as you can see, even if all the parties met their Paris commitments, the reduction in warming might be one seventeen hundredth of a degree Celsius. So why don't we ever hear about this in the mainstream media? Well, we ran across this instance of NEI Investments pressuring Rogers Communication to toe the party line on climate change. And to quote their document, uh, and this is when they've become these UNPRI activists, they say, we encouraged Rogers to take a leadership position by expressing public support for climate and carbon pi pricing in Canada. We highlighted several initiatives, including the work of the Ecofiscal Commission and the CDP's Road to Paris commitments. So um, the report that uh, they also issued a report, or a report was also issued about this time, um, by a couple of lawyers who were telling pension fund trustees that climate denial is not an option. So this, we have lawyers who are not scientists, telling pension fund trustees who sit on billions and trillions of dollars that don't even question climate change anymore because we're all on board and you better be too. And so we look now at this report in McLean's, which is a Rogers media outlet. Jeff School, the producer of Al Gore's movies, claimed in this interview that the world could have a renewable wind, solar, and battery-powered grid in a decade if we just put our minds to it, and that only political obstacles stand in the way. So no power generation experts that we know would agree to that. No one at McLean's asked him any probing questions, and it should be noted that one of McLean's editors at large is the recipient of a $765,000 school prize and is married to Minister McKinnon. <laughs> So even the Globe and Mail appear to be climate activists. They're owned by Woodbridge, which also owns Thomas Reuters, and Thomas Reuters Foundation actually even sends journalists on climate change junkets so they can learn about climate change. But do they learn about climate change? Well, we see here Professor Christopher Essex. He's a professor of applied math at the University of Western Ontario. And as he explained to me when I was at the Porto Climate Conference, he asks, journalists a POC question on climate. So he asked me the POC question, I had to pass it, and thank God I've talked with Norm quite a bit in my life, <laughs> because the question was, you know, what are the basic fundamental equations used in climate science? Can you name them? Have you heard of them? And most journalists can't even name them. Most have never heard of it. And journalists, he said, even the highest profile are typically woefully ignorant of the basics of climate science. So um, we have a blog post from Professor Essex on our, uh, on our blog, which is called Caveman, Climate, and Computers. It's really worth a read. But the essence of it is that the climate models that are said to be so predictive and successful, actually to have a, an accurate 10-year forecast you would need computing time that is the age of the universe squared. So that's just for 10 years. Now these climate models are projecting 100 years out. So you can tell that we're not dealing with accurate material here. Or as, um, as uh, Freeman Dyson said, he said, climate models are useful for understanding how the climate works. 
but they're not useful for predicting what the climate will be. It's science fiction. And um, as Dr. Kandekar said to me last spring, 18 years on from his report for the Alberta government, the GHG theory of climate is even more uncertain. So we have no free press, we have school indoctrination, and that equals poor public policy on climate and energy. So this has very serious consequences for society, very serious consequences. Here is Professor Amartya Sen, a Nobel Prize winning economist, and he explained, in the terrible history of famines in the world, no substantial famine has ever occurred with any independent and democratic country with a relatively free press. We cannot find exceptions to this rule, no matter where we look. I won't read the whole thing. He goes on to say, nearly 30 million people died in the famine of 1958 to 1961, driven by Mao's Great Leap Forward, while faulty government policies remained uncorrected for three years. The policies went uncriticized because there was no opposition party in parliament, no free press, no multi-party elections, and indeed, it is precisely this lack of challenge that allowed the deeply defective policies to continue, even though they were killing millions of people every year. Now, maybe that sounds extreme to you, like, we're in the breadbasket, how can it be that we might starve? Well, if farmers don't have fuel to uh, plant their crops and harvest, guess what happens? So, anyway, it sounds extreme. Well, I invite you to read Tombstone by Yang Zhisheng. Look at the language used in the days of Mao and think about it in the context of today, where grand achievements were attributed to the struggle against right deviating conservatism where anyone who dared to question was labeled a doubter or a denier, where anyone who exposed the fraud was subjected to struggle, social, physical, emotional harassment and battering until they agreed to comply or died. So similarly to climate change, um, these ideas were based on the work of one scientist who was not an expert in the field, or today we might look and say, well, Al Gore is not a scientist and not an expert on energy or climate science. Anyway, so if we, uh, I, I invite you to read our, our new reports um, that look at the consequences for society. The first is uh, one that rebuts environmental defense, and the second one rebuts West Coast environmental law. Both of these deal with the foreign-funded um, trade war against us. And many people talk about the um, tar sands campaign. It's just a very tiny piece because behind all this climate hype is green billionaire foundations have spent $600 million a year over a decade funding local ENGOs to push their vision of global cap and trade, um, price on carbon, and $12 trillion in vested interest to renewables. So it wasn't about climate. And we just ran a cross-Canada campaign trying to inform people that although people, and you've heard probably a couple of people at this conference say it's not fair if we're the only ones with a carbon price. If everyone had one, that would be good. Think about that a few times. If everyone had, that, had a carbon price, little old Canada with 37 million people sitting on the world's greatest riches of resources, we'd be in trouble. We already are. So let's go back to science for moment and look at the fundamental principles of scientific inquiry, and that is that science has progressed through a uniquely productive marriage of human creativity and hard-nosed skepticism. So saying, questioning and saying no is part of science. And so we, as friends of science, look back on our 16 years of um, educating the public we recall that Sally Bell Yunus was one of our first speakers, and she talked about the witch hunts of the Little Ice Age, where people were condemned to burn to death at the stake for the crime of weather cooking with Satan. And ironically, Dr. Bell Yunus was driven from her career. She was socially burnt on the stake of public opinion. And she had warned us that science needs special societal protection, and without that protection, 
Um, science will just be dialed out and in its place will be substituted the myths that humans like to create. Myths like weather cooking and state-sponsored lysenkoism. So freedom of speech is crucial to a free and democratic society. So how to fight back? Well, use social media. Create your own Alberta narrative. I've started doing videos of my own. Just telling my own story. I went down to Okotoks, did a stand-up at that big rock. <laughs> Don't let them tell you how to think. And other things that we can do, demand open and civil debate. Demand cost-benefit analysis. Demand smart goals. Don't let anybody give you a carbon tax without end. Like, what is it going to accomplish? How much? And when will it stop? And on a slightly more optimistic note, we are very honored and pleased to announce that Dr. Susan Crockford, a polar bear scientist, and Dr. Willie Soon, solar physicist, will be our special guest speakers at our April 10th event at the Red and White Club here in Calgary for polar bears and solar flares. Hope you can join us. Thank you so much. <laughs>